Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Virginia Howlett and I'm um, the chair of Women Together at St. Paul's. So welcome to Women Together at St. Paul's. We are so excited that you're all here. Before we start, I have a few Zoom rules. As people are joining, um, we will catch them up on it a bit. So the number one thing to do is to mute yourself, um, except for the speakers. Please make sure to mute yourself. If you're gonna get up and walk away, please turn off your video. It's just a little bit nicer that way. Um, everyone is gonna be on mute for the meeting. And if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. We will be definitely paying attention to your comments and questions. And after our speakers have spoken, they will pass the questions to our speakers or Terry, I'm sorry, Terry, our volunteer will pass the questions to our speakers. We're gonna be recording the Zoom session, which will be posted on the Cathedral website. So if you don't want to be recorded, just turn off your video. So a quick run through of the evening. Um, first, I'm gonna say an opening prayer, then I'm gonna introduce our speakers. After the main part of the, the, their session, Terry will pass the questions to them from the chat. We'll have a question period, Please don't unmute and speak, just let Terry speak your questions. And then um, we'll end with a closing prayer, finishing somewhere um, between seven and 7.20, depending. But uh, we will definitely finish the whole meeting by 7.30 at the very latest. All right, now let us pray. Living God, long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus's resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. Amen. Again, welcome. The theme for Women Together is being a Christian woman in a diverse world. During this ser series, we explore ways to deepen our faith as we interact with the rest of the world. Thank you for joining us on this journey. A special welcome to women attending for the first time. There's seven meetings a year on the first Thursday of the month from October to May. And you can go to the Women Together webpage on the Cathedral, the St. Paul Cathedral website for more information. Women Together isn't something that you join, you watch for publicity, each month, you sign up with an RSVP by the Monday prior to meetings, and then you attend. Due to the COVID restrictions, we're meeting on Zoom again, and I think we'll be doing that again for March, but we are hoping to have at least hybrid greetings and maybe again to have meals sometime in the future. Um, thank you again to all of our dedicated volunteers and the cathedral staff who make this event possible. Uh, a special thanks tonight to Terry Sprecco and Beverly Edge who are Zoom hosting, many other Women Together volunteers and cathedral staff who work behind the scenes. And I wanna say a special thank you tonight to Annie Hendricks who does all our publicity and Dr. Kimberly Fernandez, our registrar who keeps track of reservations. So we have three speakers tonight speaking to us about journeying together across cultures with humility respect and joy. The Reverend Laurel Mathewson, Ms. Catherine Bohm, and Riz, Ms. Ruth Japtok. Laurel Mathewson was born and raised in Oregon, but found her way to the San Francisco Bay Area to attend Stanford University. While there, she found a passion for the intersection of faith, politics, and social justice. The cultural and spiritual implications of landscape and a life partner, her now husband, Colin. Before seminary at the University of the South, Sewanee, Laura worked as a research assistant, an editorial assistant at Sojourners, and a campus missioner at UCSD. Although she began to explore the possibility of ordained ministry while attending an Episcopal church in Washington, D.C., she was confirmed, sponsored for ordination, and ordained a priest at St. Paul's Cathedral in San Diego. And she led formation at our wonderful cathedral between 2013 and 2016. In October 2016, Laurel and Colin moved across Balboa Park to begin a new adventure with St. Luke's in North Park. 
Catherine Baum is the executive director of RefugeeNet. Her educational background is in business office administration and she's fluent in English and Arabic. Before becoming the executive director of RefugeeNet, she, was, she served for three years as program manager. And she has over 10 years experience in nonprofit programs and administration, and administration, serving as a lead outreach worker, food distribution program manager, office administrator, receptionist, and interpreter. She's been a member of St. Paul's, or I'm sorry, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in North Park since 1998. And she served on the Bishop's Committee, the Audit Committee, and in women's ministry at St. Luke's North Park. Ruth Japtok is administrator and business developer at St. Luke's North Park. She grew up in Kampala, Uganda. After high school, she moved to Germany where she studied nutrition science and graduated with a bachelor's and a master's degree in, in nutrition. After graduation, she moved to the US and she and her husband, Martin, have lived in various places in Southern California before settling in San Diego. After working here in the nutrition field, she's had various positions in research, worked as a nurse, and been a small business owner. Before joining St. Luke's as operations and enterprise minister, she was employed at UCSD in cancer research. So please welcome Reverend Laurel, Ms. Bohm, and Ms. Japtok. Take it away, Ruth. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the invite today. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. So let's see. One All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting us today and thank you everybody for coming. Um, are you still there? I don't see anything on my screen, but hopefully it's coming up. <laughs> I don't we know don't, if you see we don't, We don't see the, uh, the, if you shared your screen, we're not seeing that yet. You're not seeing it yet? Okay, it should be coming up. Let's see. Okay. Something's happening though. Um, on my end, I can see the time are running so it's probably just slow but hopefully it will start well thank you our topic today very interesting topic I love it the moment I read it it just felt like this would be a topic that we could share for many, many. I'm sorry, Ruth, um, somehow we have lost you um, and I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe your connection has gone down. I don't know. So I think she's completely off. I think she, she shared her screen and I was starting to see her screen and then it seemed like her connection ended. So yeah, I'll just let her know. Um, and ask if she can come back on. Hi, this is Betsy. Um, we might have everybody turn off their videos, uh, cameras, so that there's more bandwidth for everyone to see for her to come back on. That's a great suggestion. So um, if everybody except the speakers could please just turn off your video, that would be super helpful. That might allow us a little more bandwidth. So just do stop video. Uh, everybody who's not a speaker. Thank you for that suggestion, Betsy. That was, that's wonderful. I'm going to mute myself while I call Ruth. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Um, 
we can't get her back on, we may move on to Catherine or Laurel until she's available. Let's see. So again, if you, um, if you haven't turned off your video, please go ahead and turn off your video if you're not a speaker. I see Catherine there. Yeah. Well, I don't know quite what to say and fill in the. <laughs> okay, so um, I just talked with Ruth and she's she's restarting her computer just to make sure it wasn't anything on on her end. Um, and I said, we will go ahead and um, shift gears a little bit. And Catherine, if you wouldn't mind sharing first, well, we, we know all of these women are very intelligent that they can pick up on, even though Ruth was going to start us off with our journey metaphor, I think. We'll, we'll circle back around to preparations for the journey. Um, if, if, if you're willing, Catherine, to go ahead and step in. Yes, I will. Okay, thanks. I just want to say thank you for inviting us all from St. Luke's. It was a wonderful thing. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I'm actually focusing only on topic today is talk about, because we're talking about faith, culture, and tradition. Uh, and journey. So my focus will be today uh, about my culture, who I am, where I came from, and how does it relate with my faith. Uh, let's see. If, uh, can you allow me to share my screen? <laughs> the host is it says that you are allowed to, so. Okay. Sure, I guess. <laughs> it's not showing at all. They say uh, the participant screen sharing is uh, disabled, host disabled participant screen sharing. Huh. Zoom have some a lot of rules. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll keep looking at it, but it says that all participants have the ability to share their um, screen. So hmm. let me see what's going on here. It may just mean that we can all start our videos as opposed to screen sharing. Uh, no, I, I think we should still keep our video off, if that's all right, Barbara. Um, no, I, I agree. I'm just saying that maybe what, the, what she's reading means, oh, you, people can put their video up, but I realize, yes, we shouldn't do that. Okay. Share screen. Okay, try now. Okay. Go ahead, Catherine. Go to my file. Okay, that looks positive. Okay. So. This is what I want to talk about today. Um, I would love to talk about South Sudan. The smallest, is it, should I make it bigger? Can you guys see it? If you could open your um, presentation, we just are looking at your desktop right now. Oh, it's open, I don't know. I see it in my end. Hmm. Interesting, I see it in my end. And the um, share. A second, I'm not sure why it's not showing, but I can see it in my end. And say so you're you are screen sharing, mm -hmm. and then it says stop share. Then I can see you guys here. Um, So Catherine, what you might try to do, this happened to me earlier, is if you if you close it, oh, it's actually, it was just slow. So it's it's coming. It's coming? It's coming. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are you able to see it? Not yet. It looks like it's it's still loading.
It is interesting. We seem to have um, a lot of trouble with bandwidth today. Things are slow. So I don't, we don't usually have this trouble. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but uh, I apologize everybody for such a slow start. Yeah, it does look like it's loading, Catherine, but we don't see it yet. It's loading here. It says recording here, up here, you're... Um, oh, well, I uh, figured things out. Uh, Why don't you... Do you, do you mind? just go ahead and talk about it? Yeah, um, good idea. <laughs> yeah, so let me just talk about it. So what I, today the topic I was talking about, I was talking about the youngest country in Southeast South Sudan is the youngest country. Uh, we had our independence in 2011. When I say in, I have, I'm, a, I'm American, I'm a former refugee, but my place of birth is South Sudan. I was born in the uh, capital of South Sudan, Juba, but my parents shared two different tribes. Uh, there are the tribes called Nilotic. My father from the Nuer tribes, and my mom is from the Dinka tribe. Um, the Dinka, the majority of the Nilotic tribe in South Sudan, there are like 4.5 million, and the Nuer are uh, roughly about 3 million. Um, but the majority is settled in South Sudan, and they don't share other tribes, especially the Dinka tribe. Uh, they don't have any border tribes like the Nuer. They do have the same tribe of Nuer in Ethiopia, in Gambela. Uh, but the Dinka, they just settled in South Sudan. There's no other tribes in Africa share the same custom and tradition like they are. Uh, they're kind of unique. They are uh, tall people. They're known as the tallest people. And they're very slender. And they have dark skin. Um, but they're very rich with the culture. Uh, traditionally, they are cattle keeper, they take care of cows and um, they worship God, uh, their God called Nelich, which is mean God of sky. Um, that's their practice of religion. But most of the Dinka now they're Christians and their background Episcopalian, their Anglican uh, background. But the beautiful thing about Dinka tradition uh, is the marriage because they believe God have blessed them with so much cows and that cows is the wealth and they share it among themselves when it comes to marriage. Uh, they use it as a dowry. So women are very valuable. If God bless you with beautiful daughters, I depend how many kids you have, how many daughters you have. If you have three daughters, you're the richest man. Uh, if you have four daughters, because each daughter could get married up to 500 cows. So you could probably, from all your four daughters, you could get more than uh, 2,000 cows or over 3,000 cows uh, just for marrying your kids, uh, your daughters. Um, there's a dowry. I know in the Western world, dowry means something, but in the tradition of Denka, it means honor because you raise your daughter and giving her to other family. Uh, there is this love, like we raise her, we care for her. And this is like a, a token of return. That's all I can say. It's like a token of return. We her, this is our daughter, we raise her. She's beautiful, she's disrespectful, she's so obedient, and she's gonna be a great mother. So there's a, this love uh, introduction of introducing a daughter to, uh, to the marriage. So the process is beautiful. It takes about a, a week to get the tradition marriage. Um, it takes longer for the discussion of the cows because they have to discuss how much cows their husband family will pay. This is the bride dowry. And it takes a while. It's like a heated discussion. Then they have always like a mediator to get involved. And, um, and this is a beautiful when they finally decide that, okay, our daughter is six feet or six, seven. She's worth 500 cows. So now they go by the height. <laughs> and if she had education, forget it. <laughs> they will add more. And um, for us, it's the pride because your family get to take you with the honor and the community all share for you. Um, so this is part of the tradition marriage. And, um, and until today, we're in the Western world. We don't have place to keep our cows, but we honor 
by just verbal. We all sit down, we mimic the same setting that we did back home, but we don't have actual financial to put down in a table, but we just honor our ancestor. We let the community know we have done it in a way that have done it back home, but since we don't have financial means to do it like back home, but we still honor the culture. So that's the unique part of the, the marriage in the tradition of Dinka. Um, if I talk more about the hospitality, uh, because of people live back home in separate places and it takes miles to go visit someone. So as a part of the hospitality at home, you have to, as a mother, you have to cook enough food for your family and for your visitor. Even though you don't know who's gonna visit you today, just always in mind, there's always left food for someone who ever show up in the middle of the night, will get up and warm that food for them. And then the hospitality, because they go journey, you pack food and then you let them take it along the way. Um, we kept that tradition, like I'm here in the United States and that's a beautiful part of us. Every home, if, if I'm the host today, I invited all of you guys to come to my place. I'll make sure whatever we share is a dinner or the, the event party, everyone get a bag or box to take home. So I know it's sometimes people say, this is a lot. I, I just brought something in. Why should I take something back? But this is how we're, like I say, we still honor the culture. Um, we kept it going. We teach our kid to do it. Like you have a friend, make sure you share meals. And this is part of the circle of life that we share because we believe of salt. If you share salt, like the milk have salt, so salt of life. So we, that's part of our concept and culture. Uh, if I share a meal with you, we share salt together. We share the journey of life together. Any questions? <laughs> So Catherine, they're gonna actually be able to ask questions at the end, so you can keep going, and then the, we'll circle back around. I'm just questions. asking if they're curious to ask more before I <laughs> <laughs> go more. Um, so I did talk about the tradition marriage. I talk about a culture of sharing meals together, or festival, or food, and I'll talk a little bit about the culture of belief, uh, God. Um, before Christianity. Dinka people practice their own God, which is, they call it knowledge, God the sky, but they do have different God. They have God, Dang, that's male, and a book, that's female. So Dang in Dinka language means rain. So the rain is God of rain, and Dang is God of fertility. So there's a lot of every household, there's a child named Dang. It's because we're honoring our God, um, even, and it's uh, the rain, the power of rain, it become a part of significant of Dinka. So every Dinka man, you find last name is Ding, is because the family honor that is our uh, religionly, culturally belief God. And a book is a beautiful mother and it's um, a woman. So we do have a female God and male God. So every woman that name a book is blessed. A family have used that name uh, because she's special. Um, so our names have meaning, um, special in our tribe. We name our daughters or, or sons according to the dowry cows that have sent to home. Let's say my mom, when she got married, there is a special cow because there will be always like a beautiful cow that's presenting the the rest of the cows that are bringing for dowries. So they will use the name, like let's say for example, you have a, a daughter named Yar. Yar is a, is a white and brown colors of cow. So every child had a name according to the cows. Like I say, we, we believe cows is a blessing from God. So we name cows and then we give it to our kids on the pride. <laughs> so that's maybe other people might not understand it but it, it's it's a significant and those names till today mother laura might be familiar in the church she could see in a bulletin there's yard there's a book so all these names have meaning um 
So we named our children according to situation. Um, like a family hasn't had any child for a long time, and then God blessed them with a kid. So they'll name a kid Atie. Atie means blessing, a grace. So Atie is a common name between a boy and a girl. Um, so we use that Atie as a, a blessing. So if you've met a person named Atie, automatically you'll know that person has that given name because of the special event. Um, and I'll go back over when the Christianity enter. When Christianity enter, a lot of our Dinka group uh, join Anglican background. So most of them are Anglican background and they adopted uh, their baptism name. So the names become known as a first name and then given name. So you will use your baptism name and then your culturally name. So if you're from Dinka tribe, your name probably Dane, but you could get baptized and become Peter. So you find someone named Peter Dane. Uh, so we still keep that uh, native, uh, his native identity with Christianity. But when we are in South Sudan, like that's what I told Mother Laura, the experience that we experience as a Christians, um, we all have our beautiful culture of food, um, dancing, wearing beads according to our event and all this. So we are more close families and um, we are very good at taking care of each other. When, when Christianity got in there, we all believed together. We all joined as a one think of people just went straight to one Anglican. They all worship as a Anglican background, the uh, Episcopal church in uh, so most of the Dinka are Anglican. They did not went to different dynamic, uh, uh, different church. So they focus in one area. But when the Islam rules South Sudan in general, so the Islam rule and the Islam Sharia was applied on all of us, regardless if you are Muslim or Christians, we all have to obey by the Islam rule. And uh, if your child have his Christian name, it's always your, being put in pressure that you have to convert to Islamic. So we had a lot of issue of carrying either our Christian name or should we continue with our native name? Because with our Christian name, we always have hardship with the Muslim people. So some family will name themselves, they have Christian name, it become now a nickname, but when they sign on a document, they don't use their Christian name, they will use their only native name because of the the Islamic uh, law was against us and we tried to avoid it. And we did have a civil war because of the religion uh, back in Sudan, North and South. But one thing about um, some families choose, choose to name their children Muslim name just to avoid the conflict. So you'll find someone named Layla, uh, which, is, which is Muslim name and could be Christian name too. But in our area, when you name a child Layla or Samra, uh, it's because you don't want your child when they go to school um, to get uh, a bully or anything because of their religion. So um, the Islamic actually create the fear of, among the Christians. But I could say we were so resilient. We uh, fought 23 years uh, between the North and South, even though a lot of people lost their life, but we're able to get independence. And we are an independent country. We're all Christian, uh, we do share with some Christian Muslim brothers, but the majority are Christian. So we are like the Christian state. So we declare we are separate from the Islamic law and Sharia. We want to keep our culture. We want to be um, without any judgment. Just, uh, and that's the thing I could say. It's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, people fought for their identity. And I told Mother Laura, when you heard someone from South Sudan say, I'm Christian, they mean it because they went through a hardship uh, uh, being among Muslim people. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And then Ruth, I think we'll go ahead and return circle back to you. Hey, um, I'm back and I hope it doesn't throw me off again. 
So um, let me share my screen. This is where I was and it totally threw me off. So apologies, but I'll try it. So you see the screen now? Okay, perfect. I'll try it. Um, you hear me, right? Yeah, we see the screen and hear you. Could you click okay. on the slideshow? At the very top, click on slideshow. It's right in the middle. Next to Straight animations, in. right. Straight in the middle, animations. I have File home, insert, sign, transitions, animations, slideshow. Uh, it's in the menu bar toward the top. Uh, you're, you're almost there, good. Yes. Almost there, a little almost to the there. right. To the right. To yes. the right, see the word slideshow. How come I don't see it? See more. Oh, okay. She's seeing something different than we are. I'm seeing something totally different, but um no, okay. Okay, just go ahead and proceed then. We'll proceed with yeah, this. You one. can just click on each one. Yes, I'll I'll, I'll click on each one. Okay, I'll click on each one. Ah, no, try to go faster than so. Sorry. Well, because that's the first one I was thinking about, talking about a couple of things that I'll probably skip. So, generally, we're on this journey already together, this exciting journey of um, basically journeying together across cultures with humility, respect, and joy. So briefly, as we all know, culture obviously includes so many things which Catherine has shared. So I'll probably just leave it at the different things that we all know, beliefs, values, ideas, ways of living and so on and so forth. And skip over to say, um, for example, in my culture, I'd like to share just a, an example. And that example is dressing. So as you can see, we have this beautiful dress that we call a busuti. That is a, a traditional dress from the part of the country that, I'm, um, that I was born in, um, the Baganda. And it has evolved over globalization. We have now all these different nice bright colored dresses out of so many different materials. And I'm right here in the corner wearing one of my former, my leg moms, one of them that I'm sharing there with you here. So because we're talking about, maybe I was hoping to share some tips as to maybe how to enjoy this journey better. So I wanted to ask when you first see these lovely pictures um, of these beautiful dresses, what are you seeing? And you don't really have to answer, but maybe just skip your thought and let and think about how I'm hoping you're seeing how lovely and how beautiful they are. But I'm also wondering whether you're wondering how bright and maybe differently colored and maybe a little bit mismatched colored they are. And, um, and it's okay if you think they might be a little bit too bright or too differently colored because that's the beauty of tradition that I wanted to talk about. Um, so when we first encounter something new from different cultures, we kind of come around with our thoughts about what we think it is based on what we are feeling or are used to seeing. And so something like this from a different culture that one has never seen might just, see, might just seem a little bit different, but I would like us to challenge ourselves to thinking that we carry this and look at this with a kind of new lens and seeing it as well, basically putting our judgments aside and not seeing it's just the bright colors, but just saying, wow, that is different. And that is not, you don't even have to say beautiful, but it is different. And the, you, the people from Baganda, they really love these dresses. They wear them mostly at weddings, but sometimes these days people wear them as well, just um, doing the normal work and so on and so forth. So it has a lot of material and has a lot of length. So you, you're not surprised why I'm not walking around in that every day coming to work because I might be late trying to kind of carry over my many meters of material. 
But again, I just wanted to bring that up as just an example of our diverse cultures. There are just so many cultures and traditions, even within one country and one tribe, there's so many different cultures that we all are having on a daily basis, are encountering and mostly we do not know at times how to, um, I mean, we see it and it's different, but we don't know at times whether we, we need to even make any judgment about it, apart from several times we hope to say that it's beautiful, but for the people themselves, most times it is beautiful. So there's normally no harm done in basically um, saying that, not saying that you love it, because um, I personally have some, my favorites here and some that are not so favorite. <laughs> so we as human beings have I'm just so many differences, but also many similarities. Um, I believe that there's really, the most important thing that we really have to worry about or think about is how to respect each other's differences or traditions and cultures and how they actually practice them. An aspect of showing respect comes through, for example, during communication, which I'll mention um, a little bit of more about in a little while. I was wondering again, what are, what are the first feelings, for example, when we first encounter people, what are the first feelings that we normally have? Um, I feel like it would be, I personally, when I'm going somewhere and I've never met the people before and so on, I can have some wonderings about what I'm going, how I'm going to encounter them, how am I going to communicate with them and so on and so forth. So I think it helps me to kind of alleviate my anxiety if I know a little bit more about the people even ahead of time. So I'm not expecting us to learn about all the different cultures about everybody because that's almost impossible. But sometimes just a little, or not just a little, a little, inf um, looking into someone's culture, like Catherine has described so many beautiful things about her culture right now. And I'm thinking, well, the next time I encounter, I, I meet somebody called Ertia, for example, I'm like, oh, I know that. I know a little bit about that. Again, not thinking that you know it all because we are continually learning, but it just kind of that a little bit of familiarizing with other people's culture gives a little bit more confidence in how we basically move along in this journey with them. Um, another thing, for example, that I know is music. Once in a while, we listen to music for the first time. Maybe a song is sung in a different language and we don't know the language. The voice acoustics might just be so different from what we are used to for our own aesthetics. And for the first time, we might just go like, well, that voice quality is something. It is really different. And if you'd never listened to that song again, chances are you just kind of almost just keep what you already know that you did not say like the voice quality of that. But if one gives oneself a chance to actually listen to it again, all of a sudden you might start hearing the drums, the few instruments and so on and so forth. Before you know it, sometimes you might actually start liking it. So giving oneself a chance to actually not think too much about something, but giving oneself a chance to actually familiarize oneself with something can be and is one way to, um, to get to like something that originally you might not have wanted to even have anything to do with just because it was just so different from your aesthetics and what you feel is nice and sounds good to one. And not enjoy it at first, but maybe later on does. And I really know for myself personally that that happens quite a bit that I hear songs that the first time from a different place. And especially if I don't understand the language and I go like, okay, now and then eventually though, before I know it, I do like, and I'm sure so many of us have experienced that even if it's kind of like Western music, like, you know. So I would like to move on to another topic, which would be um, communication. And um, there's, so, there's so many things and there's so many topics that we have been learning about um, mostly in recent years. Many people have been reading a lot about intercultural um, communications and diversity and so on. So things like this are mostly common to many people. I would like specifically to point out the respect part and the differences, because again, 
when we're journeying together and wanting to learn more about each other, that is respect and humility in accepting to learn what we don't know because we just cannot know about everything, I think goes a long way on this journey. So all of these are important, but again, I'm pointing out the respect and obviously the active listening and avoiding stereotyping, which is always usually mixed up with obviously being flexible and distinguishing perspectives and so on. Um, another thing that can be really helpful for me at least is finding a bit of myself in another person because much as we think there's so many differences, uh, there are really so many similarities as well as women um, journeying I mean, on the planet, there are so many differences, not just as women, but just as human beings as well. I do specifically like um, the quote coming on from Kofi Annan, but this was particularly, I've seen a couple of really nice um, statements for about culture. These ones come from the UNESCO Bank. All cultures of the world are equally entitled to respect just as all individuals are equal as regards free access to culture. Um, and then Kofi Annan comes up with a really good statement about also accepting each other and ourselves. People of different religions and cultures live side by side in almost every part of the world. And most of us have overlapping identities which unite us with very different groups. And that I feel is really true in so many ways. I had time myself, so my 10 minutes are almost over, but I'll just quickly finish up with Laura will have some time as well. Um, so we can love what we are without hating what and who we are not. We can thrive in our own tradition even as we learn from others and come to respect their teachings. Um, I can tell you that even as an African woman at St. Luke's with my African brothers and sisters, I'm continuing to learn. Um, there is a lot to learn and what I see is the excitement. Um, not when I we are going to make mistakes and we do make mistakes all the time but because we love each other and we have real love and respect for each other we know we can repair any damage and move beyond um whatever slight mistakes we make just because of our different cultures and how we perceive and usually work um amongst ourselves and differently amongst other people so finally, um, as we know, usually arts is said to unite people globally. A really important thing that seems to come out of successful journey together across cultures is peace. It, um, there is a lot of peace that seems to come from just accepting and enjoying and enjoying basically other people's cultures and traditions or respecting them generally. So bridging the gap between cultures is urgent and necessary for peace. Again, something from UNESCO, stability and development um, that was in 2021. I, I hope that we are here today because we agree in some way that there are real benefits of engaging with others from different cultures, whether it's within our cultures, in our communities, in our country, here in the USA or anywhere in the world. And also for many of us who are Christian women all over, I hope that we really do endeavor to genuinely care for each other, continue this journey, find ways to enjoy the experiences across cultures with humility, respect, and peace, because um, there is really a lot of joy and vibrance all around us if we see culture and diversity as what it is, which is just a real enriching, um, experience. Um, that's what I'm hoping that we can take away that we, Jenny, enjoy our differences, continue to be curious, learn more from each other with humility, but at the same time, um, kind of relaxing about the fact that we, at the end of the day, are so similar in different ways. And at the end of the day, as Christian women, we are sisters, respective of our differences, and actually because of our differences in a way. Thank you so much. And um, sorry that we're rushing through this and that I apologize for the problems at the beginning that have caused us, but I just got kicked out. So thank you.
Ruth, I want to say again, there's no need to apologize because one of the things that unites us is we've all had troubles with technology on Zoom this last year. So I think we can all say <laughs> we know what it's like to be to be kicked out of a of a gathering. Um, Ruth also provided a really lovely bridge for where I want to start. Um, she mentioned that you know we do at St. Luke's is a multicultural community with. Um, individuals from Sudan, as Catherine is, from Uganda, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and not to mention all the diversity within those groups and within European Americans. And we all know humans are diverse creatures. Um, and so we, we do make mistakes, but we try to ground ourselves in love. So that's where I want to start. We are all familiar with the famous passage from St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, where he says, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And this passage, which goes on to say, love is patient, love is kind, is usually associated with weddings and romantic love. But this passage was actually written to a diverse community that was fractured and fragmented and extremely dysfunctional. And so I urge us to all reconsider that First Corinthians passage as a letter that is about um, how we love in diverse communities. And I'm not going to go through that passage now, but I do encourage you to look up First Corinthians chapter 13 if you haven't in a while. But what I see in that passage is a reordering of priorities. And I think that applies to even the concept of how we journey together as people of diverse people of faith. So I would hear in that passage, more important than saying the right thing, more important than understanding everything about the other person, or even understanding everything about the other person's culture, more important than having the right kind of knowledge or awareness about the world, more important even than a faith that is rock solid or a generosity towards others that's extravagant, more important than all of these things is to ground ourselves in love. And as with Paul's list, the things that I've mentioned are not bad. They are indeed good things, but they are secondary to love and they can never become the first thing or things get distorted in our community life and in our relationships with one another. So the beautiful thing about that passage is that, of course, after saying that love is the most important thing. St. Paul goes on to give a very helpful description of what love looks like, which we need in most human relationships, but we need especially in relationships where we feel we are on uncertain cultural ground. Those places where we know we see each other dimly, even as we want to see each other more clearly, as we want to see God more clearly. And those three hallmarks that St. Paul gives us are, of course, patience, kindness, and humility. We are familiar with these words. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. The question is, of course, always, how do we live out this kind of love? I don't have any simple answers, but I can tell you one thing that I've learned at St. Luke's is that it flows most naturally for me out of a certain posture a certain remembering. And that remembering is that I am a human being made in the image of God. You are a human being made in the image of God. And no matter what the world says about our respective status or importance or worth, we stand on level ground before the Lord. And this reframing of identity and faith for me has been a corrective to the energies that can lead us to envy or arrogance or rudeness or even deference or distance. So with that in mind, that sort of love in mind, I would like to share with you a story of um, the first time that I visited a Sudanese American parishioner's house. And this is a time when I made a lot of mistakes. Um, so I was visiting a wonderful woman named Susie Laku, who is a pillar of our community. And she had invited me over for dinner 
or actually it wasn't clear it was for dinner. So she invited me over and we communicated over text message about the best time to visit. I went to Susie's house and I sat down and she served me tea. And then we began to talk and I asked Susie questions about her family and she shared a lot about her life and her background. And it was a great privilege to learn more about Susie's story. And then at the end, what I thought was the end of our time together after a long period of sitting, I offered some prayers. I asked if we could pray together and we prayed together. And at this point I was getting really uncomfortable because I didn't know if she had dinner for me or not. There was not the normal social cues I was used to around is dinner going to be served or not. I didn't want to assume that there was dinner, but I didn't know how to ask politely. I didn't yet know some of the basic norms of Sudanese hospitality, some of the ones that Catherine was talking about in terms of um, you, you are not served food until prayer has happened. So if I would have prayed earlier, dinner might have happened earlier, but I didn't know that then. Um, and so I was uh, very awkwardly trying to engage this question of dinner. And Susie said, you could stay for dinner. That would be okay. And I did not yet fully understand the implications of being in communication with an indirect culture, in which Sudanese culture is more indirect. And we as in European American culture tend to be more direct. And so when she said it would be okay, I didn't know if she really wanted me to stay for dinner. All this to say, this went on and on. Awkwardly, I ended up saying I had to go. I had to put the kids to bed. I left and then it became very clear that Susie had spent a lot of time preparing a homemade meal for me. But by the time I realized this, it was I was too far out the door to really repair the damage. So Susie is packaging up uh, bags and bags of food for me to take home. I'm feeling terrible the whole time, but not knowing how to get out of it. I remember calling my sister on the way home and saying, I think I just made so many terrible mistakes. I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is, you know, it's, I, I just made a mess of my first visit. And then I saw Susie at church on Sunday and I said, Susie, I'm so sorry. I, I, I didn't realize you'd spent so much time cooking and I like just made a mess of it. And she looked at me and she gave me a wry smile, kind of a, a, a wonderful Susie half smile that was knowing and she knew <laughs> that I knew and she knew that I was learning. And what she said was, she said, it's okay. You'll know next time. So I was learning and she knew that I would, I would do better next time. I was learning these things as I went. And so what I encountered in that moment with Susie was a woman who was gracious, who was patient. Um, and who and who gave me both um, patience and grace in my learning process. So that is an example of the love that Paul goes on to write about that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. There is a grittiness to Christian love and community, a steadfast perseverance that is not reactive or panicked when things go wrong. And the love of God can be a steadying weight amidst the rough waters that can and will arrive in any community. But we may need extra reminders of this in a multicultural community because we are often being asked to flex muscles that our culture does not require often of us, especially as white people, because our culture and economy continue to segregate us very powerfully. And so our default is mostly interacting in significant ways with people who have similar cultural backgrounds to ourselves. So especially in our communities of faith, if we are blessed to be in a community of faith that's more diverse, we need this reminder from scripture to encourage us to bear it when we are misunderstood or when we feel uncomfortable or make mistakes in big or small ways. Um, there are other moments of mistakes and um, sort of painful learning I could share, but I want to move to a couple other pieces. Um, I, I mentioned that for me, one of the most grounding and helpful postures is to remember that I'm a human being made in the image of God. Something that flows out of that is that the basic human norms of relationships still apply in a church, um, in, a, in a church community, 
and especially in a diverse church community. And those, some of those basic human norms that we know about, but we can forget when we're so eager to learn about another person or build a relationship is that it takes time and attention to build any relationship. So we are transformed and life-changing relationships are created with thin layers of paint with many small interactions over time, which build trust. So if you ask a painter, the best way to paint a wall is not one big gloppy mess of a coat, like one single coat that's all gloppy and uneven. The best way to build a good coat of paint is to actually do many thin layers. And I think this applies well to the ways in which we form relationships across lines of difference. Um, because when we have, when we build on interaction after interaction and we allow those small interactions to build upon each other, they really can become something that is strong and durable and lasting. Um, and then in that space, a relationship that we build doesn't eliminate the differences we share, but then we can learn to find great joy in sharing with one another um, together. So I want to, one final kind of biblical lesson that I want to tie to something I've learned at St. Luke's um, from folks, especially in the Sudanese community and Congolese community who have come to the States as refugees and who have endured much greater persecutions than I have ever known or imagined for their faith or um, for their identity, who have um, suffered in many ways from material lack in ways that I've never known, and yet who bring into worship a, an incredible spirit of joy and trust. Um, I really feel like one of the gifts of being at St. Luke's is this gift of faith and joy that is brought and it has really brought before my mind's eye the truth of um, the fact that there is this sweet spot for faith. Um, and there's many ways of talking about it, but one way is Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. And in that proverb, um, the writer says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need, or I shall be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? For I shall be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And I've learned, as many of you have in different contexts, that there is no glory in poverty and that everyone deserves a life with dignity and enough. But there's also real um, perils to having too much and forgetting God and the ways in which we can rely on God and the joy that that can bring when uh, that relationship with God is more central to our lives. Finally, I want to encourage um, us in the honor and joy of sharing our cultures within the context of relationships. So Ruth and Catherine and I were talking about um, how we, we all don't know a lot about different cultures. Uh, and we can, we can look on National Geographic, we can watch documentaries, we, can, we have so much information at our disposal now that we can satisfy our curiosity if it's just an intellectual curiosity in a lot of different ways. But there is a particular joy um, and grace that comes from sharing our cultures within the context of human relationships. So the way that this has lived out, um, been lived out for me at St. Luke's, or one example, is the ways in which we have been given African dress. So I had never, I've never been to the continent of Africa. I hope to go this spring. We're hoping to take a delegation trip, but I clearly had never um, worn an African dress or African fabrics. And within the first year of arriving at St. Luke's, I was given two different dresses. One was from a Congolese family who had clothing made for me and for Colin. And another was from a Sudanese family that also had um, outfits made for our family. The first time I wore my Congolese skirt, which was a wrap skirt, um, the oldest daughter in the family came up to me and told me very graciously, 
and she whispered it on Sunday morning, you're wearing that backwards. <laughs> so once again, I had this experience of humility. Okay. I did not put this dress on properly. I went into the bathroom and turned it around because it turns out the ruffles went in the front, not in the back. Um, and I'm, I'm learning. And now I wear that dress with great joy and I still love to wear it um, on certain on festive occasions. Another example of sharing within relationships that is different than if I just go to a restaurant and try a new food is that our family has learned um, to love particular foods that we've been exposed to in particular ways. So my son, Jem, has a love for African donuts. There are many different names for different kinds of African donuts, but the two that are most common at St. Luke's are called Zalabia and Mendazi. And Jem loves these African fry breads. And what I love is the way that the ladies in the kitchen spoil him by putting aside donuts for him and writing his name on a bag that says Jem and then giving me an extra bag of donuts for him to take home. They're spoiling him in the best ways that kids can be spoiled at church. And then my daughter loves um, the sour bread from East Africa called Injera. And many of the other stews that the Mama Africa made, ladies make, she thinks the potato beef stew is absolutely amazing. And one night I came home from one of those home gatherings that um, Catherine mentioned, and the kids said, Mom, did you bring food home? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, thank you. Thank you, because Dad just served us leftovers. And then they dug into the Sudanese food that was before them. And, and my daughter said, thank God for St. Luke's <laughs> because there, there's this delicious meal. And my kids were sitting there eating collard greens with um, peanut butter and these other uh, delicious entrees that, again, I encourage you to try from Mama Africa. And with that, in closing, I want to say that I could buy an African print skirt on Amazon because I admire the colors but I don't think I would, and it certainly wouldn't be as meaningful or carry as much joy for me. If you would have told me that I would be wearing a Congolese style dress on Easter Sunday, seven years ago, I would have said, I couldn't, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be authentic or respectful. I'm a white woman who has no ties to that culture. That would, I can't even imagine that I could ever do that respectfully. But I've discovered with the help of my brothers and sisters at St. Luke's that we can be invited to appreciate and participate in the cultures of others. And that when entered into with humility and gratitude, this practice of sharing can be joyful indeed. So with that said, I want to just briefly, I know we're at 707, so I promise this will only take three minutes. I want to share um, just a few pictures with you um, that will hopefully bring some of this to life. And this is truly a brief slides. Um, so I'll share. Okay, so here you have, this is our family um, five and a half years ago when we first arrived at St. Luke. So this is our first Sunday um, in October of 2016 back when I would have said, oh, I would never wear an African style dress because that wouldn't be respectful. And then here we have me meeting for the first time, um, Mama Rhoda, who is Catherine Baum's grandmother. And you can actually see she has a beautiful African print skirt on that she's wearing to church that Sunday. And then this is a picture of um, my son, Jem and Shabani and Jem is wearing one of the shirts that was made for us, um, by a Sudanese family that she had made for him. This is the shirt that was made for him that he's wearing. And then this is Susie Laku, the gracious woman who invited me to her house and then even invited me back again after I made such a terrible mess of the first visit. Um, and this is Colin and I on Easter Sunday in 2021, when we were worshiping outside and these are, um, Congolese dresses or, or a material that was made into clothing for us by a parishioner. We had a learning pod, 
Um, so this was a picture day for our learning pod. And I wanted to emphasize that this is not just for clergy. This is not just like, oh, we're, we're the priests, so we get made clothes. This is the learning pod staff um, from last year. And we have here three Sudanese women and two European American men. And they are all wearing um, the African attire that our director of the learning pod organized for that day. Um, so they were all invited to wear these beautiful colors and beautiful shirts. And then I'm emphasizing too, it's not just me and Colin. Look, this is Mother Susan Astorita, who was served at a, as a priest at St. Luke's before we arrived. And this is a picture of Mother Susan in 2015 with um, some of the elders of the church, including Mama Tabisa. And I believe that's Mama Rochelle, but I am not sure. So Catherine, you could, um, I can't tell if it's her just looking a little different. And then there's Susie and a woman I do not know. So that is, um, those are the pictures I wanted to bring to you just to um, bring a little bit of that joy of sharing to life. And at this time, I think we're open to questions. If um, Terry, you wanted to pass on some of the questions from the chat. Yes, let's see. We have some comments um, from Sue Kelly. She's saying, it's lovely. I just love the way the meal and communal feeling go home with your guests. It's beautiful. Um, and from Barbara, I love when names have significance, especially when it's associated with special things. And Barbara was again reflecting, having gone through the war, it makes many of us listening wonder if we would have the same strength to stand up for our beliefs. And then this was my question regarding the Basuti pat, the dresses. Do families have their own patterns or do women choose their own? Oh. That's a great question, Terry. Actually, families don't usually have their own. Women do choose their own. So um, it all seems like it's an easy thing to have, but Busuti is because they have so much material, are actually used to be very expensive pieces. So ooh, apart from weddings where people wear the same things at times, generally you would, a woman would buy a Busuti based on how much money she has for her Busuti and then, um, the next time would be probably different color. So maybe culture was because of need that we just kind of wear whatever is available at the time because you're going to went through a lot, a long, long war where there was barely anything, not sugar, not soap, nothing. And so material was not available as well. So I imagine um, we took on a custom of just what is available is what we take and that vibrancy of all the different colors. But obviously um, that's a really great question. I don't think I know any family who has Different, different color for their facilities, but this is an interesting thought. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Um, some comments about the dresses. They love them, um, the colors. The sleeves remind me of uh, Filipino traditional dresses. That was from Monique. And a couple comments again from Barbara. She says that she finds it's best just to be open and ask questions and enjoy each other. Um, Virginia has a question. Can you give us personal examples of your challenges and joys working across cultures at St. Luke in North Park? In Virginia, was that directed to any one um, presenter? So uh, what happened is that um, I know I'm not letting anybody else unmute and talk, so it's kind of unfair that I get to unmute and talk, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I was, um, thinking especially about Catherine and Ruth, because now Laurel has told us a lot of very interesting personal examples for her. Um, but how has it been for Catherine and Ruth? What specific stories could you tell us as well about your experiences across cultures? I think you want to go or? Go. You go ahead, Catherine. My experience when I first attended St. Luke's in 98, I didn't speak English. So I was just sitting in a pews listening to worship. Like I, I was listening to pastor talking. It's just, I don't, it, it was just a, a language, but I was so eager to learn it. 
uh, maybe the challenge is that I didn't hear most of my uh, worship in the beginning, <laughs> but that's the only thing I could say. So thank God I've learned it. <laughs> Catherine, do you mind? I, I have to say to everyone that Catherine uh, in particular is so gracious that we were having these meetings uh, leading up to this, uh, trying to see, you know, what have been the joys and challenges. And she was being so positive about everything. I said, Catherine, there must be something <laughs> that has been hard or chat, like, or there's been a, like offended you or been that you have this spirit of grace, but certainly there's something that has bothered you over the years. And I'm wondering, Catherine, if you wouldn't mind sharing what you shared with me in that meeting, because I think it's an important point for everyone to hear if you'd be willing to share it. Oh, uh, one thing uh, was bothers me before a lady asked me, because it was because of the weather, uh, it was so hot. And, and then she was complaining about the weather. I say, yes, it's really hot. And she's like, well, it it's not hot because we come from uh, comparing to here. So I get offended because if you think about it as a human, we adjust with the climate. Mm -hmm. I know I came from a hot place, but I haven't been there for quite a while. So my body changed to the environment that I'm living in. So I could feel the cold, I could feel the heat. Mm -hmm. I, I'm adjusting and then adapting. So just, I felt like how come she's clueless that I know I came from the very hot place, but I'm living here for quite some time. And I could say, so that's just one thing that I share with Mother Laura. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I uh, got me offended is, uh, asking about the number of the family size. Um, people don't understand why a lot of Sudanese have more than five, six kids. And a lot of judgment comes to our income. We're in a poverty line. Why do we have more kids? And it's, it's just because, uh, I, like I say, Ruth says, spend time, get to know people, don't judge. So sometimes people judge by you walking with too many kids. Like, how could you handle support those children? But if you know where the background come from, and like I mentioned, we have lost so many people in the war. So some of the family don't even have immediate family member. Um, when they get married, the kids have become the start point of their life. So they lost a brother, sister, uncle, mother. So they don't have anybody. So the family start from their children and then they restart again. So um, that's the one thing I could say. Uh, knowing the culture and knowing why people don't judge everyone because of their uh, poverty line or <laughs> that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was gonna say, even, I mean, there's a lot of learning and what I don't, what I do not want to wish to do is to make everybody feel like, oh my goodness, this journey of learning is tiring because it is, it can feel a little bit like you might, it's easy to feel as though, oh goodness, there's so much I need to learn before I can even move to the next level, but it's not even that bad. However, it is true that it is constant learning because even as an African woman from East Africa and Sudan, the South Sudan and Uganda neighbor each other, we still have very distinct cultures and ways of doing things. So much as I've, I would imagine and think, you know what, I think my sister does understand me when I, I mean, when I do things, it is not a given. I, I too have to develop trust of the people. I have to develop that um, ability for people to understand that um, maybe in my culture, I do things a little bit differently and maybe I, a little bit more direct, maybe not as direct as the Germans maybe, but also our <laughs> parts have been, uh, the way we come to be in America is shaped by all the journeys that we've come through. And I have a journey too that came, although I did not come as a refugee to the States, but there was reasons why I ended up in Europe for my studies and here. And it's, there's so many experiences that we make along the way even as people of one tradition and culture, that by the time we kind of get into this big melting point of yep, of a church, sometimes we have even expectations of, oh, we're Christians. And then we think things are just gonna go like, okay, we're Christians, you know, soldering around as Christians, but we still have to have 
all the sensibilities for the different people and hoping all along to including our um white american brothers and sisters there's things there that we also have to kind of be aware of that they are making a lot of accommodations for us so the accommodation is not really on one side it is on all sides and it's not exhausting but it keeps us on our toes sometimes it is exciting it's a journey of learning and excitement so i'm happy to be on it and i encourage you to be on it because at the end of the day out of love like um catherine and mother laura have really said it with the biblical um quotes we can make it a fun journey as in we will not tiptoe around each other as long as we know it is for a good cause which is generate genuine well through to the end as christian women in love um, with humility peace and joy um that's we have one more question or do you want to call it now virginia i think i think sadly i think um we have to um stop um we we got a little bit of a slow start because we all had our wonderful challenges with technology but um i am so glad that both catherine and ruth got to add some comments because i think um that was really really helpful to to all of us just to hear a little more from you um I just want to say thank you so much. This was incredibly inspiring, and um, and it applies to us uh, across big diversity of cultures and little differences of culture. I mean, uh, to me, all the things you were talking about apply to talking for me talking to people who have different politics, or they might be European American but a different kind, and they have a whole different culture even within that and different outlooks than I do. So it applies you know, in little ways and big ways to, to all of us. I just really appreciate your example. And um, I, I just found this very inspiring, that, that metaphor of, of it takes time and thin layers of paint um, was really lovely. And the sense of needing to re have respect and listening. And it's just, it's very helpful to, uh, to hear all three of your perspectives. <laughs> on this am amazingly important topic for all of us, especially right now in the United States when it feels like people are so divided. Um, the more we build bridges uh, to each other and find ways to um, be joyful and humble with each other, that's powerful, powerful stuff. So thank you. Um, so I think at this point, I'm gonna um, call us to, to the end of our time together. Um, before I make the closing prayer, say the closing prayer, I have a few announcements. Please fill out our evaluation form. There's a link in the chat, also on our webpage, and um, we will send out a copy of the chat to everybody who attended with a link for the evaluation form. We, we really take your comments and suggestions seriously. We love to get suggestions for other programs and speakers, and uh, so please um, take time to do that. We need volunteers. We're especially looking for people who are good with technology. Um, you can donate, which is was in the link uh, to this. And there's also on the St. Paul Cathedral website, there's a donate now button at the bottom of the Women Together page. Um, any amount is appreciated. Um, we used to make our money from meals and wine and we don't get to do that anymore. So it's, it's helpful to um, get some small donations from everyone. A video recording of this will be posted on the cathedral website um, in a few days. It's not immediate, but uh, please check um, the Women Together page on stpaulcathedral.org for that. You have to scroll down to the bottom and there's a list of, of all of the um, sessions that we've recorded. Um, in March, our speaker is going to be Erica Morgan, who is a parishioner at St. Paul's Cathedral and completely different topic um, about climate change, reality, forgiveness, and hope in the era of climate change. And, um, and Erica is going to talk to us about the sobering reality of the current climate crisis, but also provide some concrete examples of what we can do and share some reasons to look ahead with hope. It's a very different sort of more science oriented um, talk for us. So thank you again. Um, all the volunteers from the cathedral, clergy and staff who made this event possible. Thank you so much to our three wonderful speakers. Um, you've really inspired us tonight. <laughs>
And um, to close, let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you will bless our work in mission and ministry in the world. Help us pray fervently, labor diligently, and give liberally to make known the power of your love given through your son, Jesus Christ. Let us not forget the lessons from the past, nor fear the challenges of the future. Anoint us with your grace and shine in our hearts as we reflect your light throughout the world. Amen. Mm -hmm.